Good morning. This is John with the Everyday Bible Study. I want to welcome you here. Glad to have you here with us today. And we're going through the Word of God, and we're going through the book of Luke, which is the story of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to be studying just a little bit in the 19th chapter, but we're mostly going to be into the 20th chapter today. When I did my last Bible study, I forgot to read uh, the last few verses of the 19th chapter. And it was talking about Jesus cleansing the temple. I did talk about it a little bit, but I forgot to read the verses. And I want to cover that today. And this is very important because Jesus, as you know, taught a life of holiness. And uh, the people that were in the temple, the temple was the primary place where the Jewish people would worship God. And um, it was very special even to God. God set it up. Even when uh, they went through the desert going into the promised land, uh, they would have the tabernacle, which was very similar to the temple. And uh, the temple uh, was the primary place where the, the sacrifices were made uh, to uh, roll back the sins of the people. And, of course, that would be done away with when Jesus Christ uh, came, uh, uh, not immediately by the Jews themselves, but as the Christians, uh, they realized that they didn't have to do that anymore, that Jesus Christ himself, when he died on the cross, uh, became the perfect sacrifice for man, the only one that could truly redeem the sins, or the only one that could actually uh, be uh, a sacrifice that was adequate in the eyes of God uh, to take away the sins of man. And uh, But uh, uh, as a stopgap measure, God had set up the temple as a way to worship. And now when Jesus is around, has, has lived on the earth, we now worship God in spirit and in truth. And we can worship God anywhere we live. We don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. Although, uh, I'd love to go to Jerusalem. I hear it's a beautiful place. And it's the place where Jesus and the apostles walked. And uh, it's a very special place to Christians. And, uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, the enemy, Satan, he, he wants to get in on that too. And uh, the uh, uh, Muslims also consider Ju Jerusalem to be a very special place for them. But um, that's probably because of uh, God himself setting up Jerusalem as the place where Jesus Christ would be uh, crucified. And in the Quran, uh, they don't agree to that. Uh, they don't agree that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Uh, they look at Jesus as being a prophet. But, and he was a prophet, but he was much more than a prophet because he came to uh, share the gospel and to be the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb of God, the son of God, who died for the sins of the world. And then he rose from the dead, and they don't acknowledge that either, and uh, that he conquered over sin and death. And we need a powerful Savior that can save us from our sins, not just a prophet. And uh, Jesus is the true Savior for our sins. But we're going to look and see what Jesus did here. And we look at Jesus cleansing the temple. And it um, doesn't mean he took a mop and a broom to it, but he took something else to it. And it said here in verse 45, it says, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold. They were selling animals to sacrifice there in the temple and charging exorbitant prices. Uh, because, you know, people were traveling uh, from many uh, countries all over the area uh, to go to the temple. And uh, it just wouldn't be practical for them to bring livestock all these great distances and have to walk with the livestock. And so they would buy the livestock that would be used, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the bulls, the um, uh, various, uh, the sheep. Uh, or goats, uh, or even the, even if you're poor, the turtle doves, uh, that would be used for the sacrifice. And uh, they were selling them there, and they'd have money changers there, and they would uh, exchange your currency for the currency. They had a special currency that was used just for the temple. And uh, that's just so that they could make more money off of people. And that's, that's a very sad thing. But uh, anyway... Uh, Jesus told him, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of robbers. And we're not supposed to get into the ministry or any sort of ministry profession to get rich. 
And uh, it's not that it is necessarily a sin to be a rich person, but it does make it much more difficult for a person if they are uh, rich uh, to enter king, uh, the kingdom of heaven, to, to go to heaven. And Jesus warned us of this and uh, he, because the money itself becomes our idol and we actually end up uh, worshiping the money instead of God. And the Bible also tells us that money is the root of all evil. Not that money itself is evil, but it's the root uh, because we can end up worshiping riches instead of God. And that's a very dangerous thing to do. And it said, as he was teaching daily in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the temple were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything that they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. And, uh, you know, they just didn't want to cause a riot if they were to try to arrest him in the temple because he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was actually just uh, proclaiming the word of God. He was the living word. And everything that Jesus said was the word of God. Now we're going to go on to chapter 20. And they're going to uh, actually try to challenge the authority of Jesus, try to bring arguments up against him. And uh, he says here in the first verse of chapter 20 of the book of Luke, it says, One day Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. The chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us, by what authority do you do these things? Or who it is that gave you this authority? And he's going to tell them. He answered them, I will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, Well, if we say from heaven, he'll say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death. For they are convinced that John was a prophet. And John actually was a prophet. Uh, so they answered him that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you what authority I do these things. And see, they were trying to trick Jesus, uh, trying to uh, mess him up as far as his um, ministry was concerned uh, so that they could arrest him and, and kill him. And uh, eventually they would do that, but it would be in God's time, not their time. And now Jesus gave a parable and said, this is the parable of the wicked tenants. And said, he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted in a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went to another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent his servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him up and sent him away empty handed. And of course, this was uh, that owner's fruit and he was, you know, deserving of that. And, uh, of course, that was a terrible thing just to beat up the servant of uh, the owner of the vineyard. So um, in verse 11 it says, And he sent another servant, but they also beat him and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third, and this one they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. Maybe they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him, so the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now when they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, uh, What then? Is this that is written, the stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. And every one that falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Uh, I don't know if you realize what this was exactly talking about, but Jesus was prophesying about himself right here. And, of course, he was the Son of God and was sent by God the Father in order to come to man to bring them the truth. And um, uh, basically, he was holding uh, these religious leaders accountable for the truth that God had sent them in the past. And uh, so uh, the um, servants that he was referring to is uh, referring to the various prophets that had come before. And many of the prophets had been killed by the religious leaders. 
or had been um, shamed by the religious leaders or treated very poorly. And then when Jesus came to them, uh, he was prophesying that they would kill him. And uh, they knew in their heart that that was their intention. And, uh, but uh, they, they said, surely not. But the fact is, um, that is exactly what would happen. Now, they're, they're still trying to trick him and, and uh, trying to come up with some way to uh, make him look um, like he's, he's not a legitimate teacher. So, so here the scribes and the chief priests also sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that they had told this parable against them. And guess what? He did. But uh, they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who would pretend to be sincere so that they might catch him in something he said. And, you know, it was a real common way to teach back then was that you wouldn't have a, quote, set curriculum. You wouldn't have a book that you'd be teaching from. But you'd be teaching from the knowledge that's in your head and in your heart. And uh, they'd have a rhetorical style of teaching that was popular with the Greeks. Basically, um, a lot of that would be answering questions that the individuals would have in order to gain knowledge. And uh, so it was real common uh, way to teach then was to just constantly have questions and uh, just a back and forth. And it's, it's not a bad technique. It's actually very good. And um, so here it said they uh, watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere so that they might catch him in something that he said so they could deliver him up to the authorities and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly. And of course, they didn't feel that way, but they, they said that. And show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. It's very interesting. What they said was correct. Not that they necessarily believed that, but uh, it was true. And said, is it lawful for a man to give tribute to Caesar or not? And, um, you know, some of them felt that uh, when the Messiah comes, he should have take over uh, rule of the Roman government and should uh, uh, be an earthly king. And that was something that they thought Jesus was going to possibly do at some time. They knew that he was very powerful. And uh, so uh, this may have been a question asking him, hey, what's your intention? You're going to be a king? You're going to try to take over? And uh, But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius. Now, denarius was a small silver coin that was issued by the Roman government, and it was roughly a day's wages. It would be real common for a man to labor in the fields or labor in some sort of physical job, uh, and... Uh, they would receive a denarius. I remember back when I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, there were a lot of day laborers, and many of them were immigrants, uh, illegal immigrants, that would come over and just do work. And a lot of times they would, uh, uh, they'd have little offices around, or they might meet at the Home Depot, and uh, they uh, uh, would be people that would come by, and they might need a dozen people to work in their fields that day, or they may have a construction project that uh, needed some workers, and they would just go and pick up the day laborers. And uh, typically, at that time, this was back um, 15 or so years ago, uh, they would pay them in cash and pay them $50 a day. And when my money got tied, I, temp I, I was tempted to do that too, but um, I have a uh, physical disorder that wouldn't really have allowed me to do a very good job at that. So, uh, But it was typically the illegal aliens that did that. Now, there, there were people that lived in the United States that were between jobs and stuff, and they would work as day laborers as well. And uh, But now the uh, normal payment for a day laborer or somebody that was under contract would be a denarius, one of those little silver coins. And that would be the equivalency of today, uh, probably somewhere between $50 and $100. And um, he's, Jesus said, show me a denarius. And he asked, whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar. And actually, I've owned, owned some uh, copper Roman coins. Uh, they're actually pretty common. Uh, you'd think a, a, a coin from the Roman Empire would be a rare thing, but there's, there's a lot of those small Roman coins that, um, the, although they are collectible, uh, they may only be worth 4 or $5 uh, these days if you get one from a coin collector and, or if you get it on eBay. And you can buy them. And uh, the more... Uh, valuable Roman coins like the denarius, uh, they may be a few hundred dollars a piece, 
uh, but um, um, because they're a little bit more rare. And uh, but the lighter date Roman Empire coins uh, that are made of copper are very common, and you can still buy those. And they they have a picture of Caesar on them as well, whichever Caesar uh, they were uh, minted under. So these denariuses always had a um, on the front, just like in the United States, we have coins that have pictures of presidents on the front. They had the Caesars on theirs, and so that's an old tradition. And uh, they said Caesar was on the front of that coin. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they, and they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he had said, but were marveling at his answer. And they became silent. Because basically what he was saying is, um, you know, if the Roman government insists that you pay taxes pay taxes because the taxes themselves have Caesars on there but uh, you know if if you're to owe something to God be it a sacrifice or a tithe or whatever uh, that God had set up uh, then you need to do that or maybe it's you giving your time or uh, bearing good fruits as a Christian um, you know winning people to Christ or sharing the gospel then you are to render those things to God but if the if, you're, if your local government uh, demands that you pay a tax, then you need to do that because that's how your uh, Christians are always have been admonished to uh, keep the laws of the land of the country that they live in, except in the rare cases where those laws would be in opposition to the law of God. I'll give you an example of that. Here in the United States, uh, abortion is still legal. Now, uh, of course, abortion involves killing an unborn child. So in that particular case, uh, most Christians in the United States oppose abortion. And uh, so um, if an uh, uh, individual gets pregnant, then they're not going to abort their child. And they would probably encourage other people uh, that are pregnant to not abort their child because uh, that's not what God would want. Uh, God wants uh, there to be life, and he gives us life. Life is a gift of God, and uh, we should cherish life because of that. Cherish our own life and cherish the life of others. And, of course, cherish the life of a child. And uh, so uh, abortion is not even to be considered if you're a Christian. And you say, oh, I feel really bad because, you know, uh, I didn't know this, and I aborted a child. Uh, sometime in my past. Well, guess what? God forgives. And even if you've done something like that, knowing that it was wrong, God can still forgive you of that. And God has promised that as we become born again, uh, that he makes us into a new creation in Christ. And all things in the past are passed away. All things are made new in Christ, which is really good. And uh, yeah, we're going to have guilt for the bad things that we've done. But God forgives us of that. And he actually forgets our sins because of the wonderful uh, grace that Jesus has done for us when he died on the cross. Uh, not only to save us for our sins, but to redeem us for our sins, which means to pay the price for our sins. So um, we're not to do those things that would destroy life, but uh, regardless of, uh, you know, if you've murdered somebody, if you've had an abortion, uh, if you've uh, stolen from other people, uh, if you've committed sexual sins, uh, that's, the, I mean, it's not okay that you did those things, but if you repent of those sins, turn away from those sins, and turn to God and ask Him to forgive you of your sins, then He will forgive you, and uh, He'll forgive you of all unrighteousness. The Bible promises that, that, us that. And uh, so, here we see that... Uh, if uh, we're a member of a local uh, government or a national government, that we need to, if it's not in direct opposition to the law, then we need to keep all the laws of the government. I mean, that even means the little stuff. That means you're not supposed to speed in your vehicle. Uh, that uh, you're uh, supposed to, uh, you know, pay your taxes and do your civic duties on a daily basis. But at the same time, um, what uh, God demands, we need to uh, 
do those things for God that he demands too. And we learn these things by studying the word of God like we are today. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for, for this wisdom that Jesus gave us. And, uh, you know, sometimes the uh, people in our life will try to trip us up. But, Lord, we pray, uh, just like King Solomon did, that you give us wisdom to know how to deal uh, with the difficult people in our life and even those people that are influenced by the enemy, influenced by Satan, uh, to say things that would try to destroy us and destroy our ministry. And, Lord, we pray that uh, as we see this wisdom and uh, this wisdom that was so amazing uh, that the people would marvel and even go silent by the things that Jesus would say, uh, let us realize that we need Jesus as our Savior. And it's going to be a, a sad time, as we see in these lessons, uh, Jesus giving up his life freely uh, to save us from our sins and going through all the torture and all the uh, terrible things that happen uh, there at his death. But uh, Jesus did that of his own accord because he loved us. And uh, we need to accept your love and your sacrifice, his sacrifice for us. And uh, we need your sins to be redeemed. The uh, Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, we got to have that sin debt paid. We can't do it ourselves. So we need to accept Jesus. We need to turn from our sins and ask him to save us from our sins so that we can be redeemed, so that we can be born again and be children of God. Be in your kingdom, Lord. And we pray that many that are watching this today will have conviction upon their hearts and will be drawn to you so that they will gain this very valuable salvation. And when they believe, we pray that they will confess that uh, to another person and get involved in a good church and start reading the Bible and pray constantly and get baptized uh, so that they can uh, be well grounded in the kingdom. Lord, we just want to thank you for your love and thank you uh, that you care for us enough uh, to provide Jesus to us and provide the salvation and provide your holy word to us to transform us and to draw us close to you. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining the Everyday Bible Study today. And uh, we hope that these uh, lessons are touching your heart and touching your mind and bringing you into a greater understanding of who God is and who Jesus is and all the good things that he has for you. And we ask that you share these messages with people on uh, social media or bring them into your home and let them watch them on your phone or your computer or your tablet, just however uh, you end up watching these particular videos. And uh, uh, also hit that subscribe button on uh, the I Am Alive page or up on YouTube. And uh, you can get uh, notifications of these messages uh, these, uh, the Word of God being proclaimed, coming to you um, multiple times per week. Uh, this past week we got five of them out, and uh, we're, we're shooting for cl as close as we can to get these done every day. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever be able to get seven out a week unless I get a week of vacation, which isn't real likely right now. But um, we're going to do as many of these as we can because we want to let the Word of God transform you from the inside out and God is powerful and he's powerful through his word and he's powerful through uh, his living word which is Jesus Christ who is still alive in heaven and is coming back for his church and his children uh, so we're praying that uh, today that you have a blessed day and thank you for joining the everyday Bible study see you next time